This Week in Virology, the podcast about viruses, the kind that make you sick. From Microbe TV, this is TWIV, This Week in Virology, episode 513, recorded on September 25th, 2018. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you are listening to the podcast All About Viruses. Today we are coming to you from the 13th International Double-Stranded RNA Virus Symposium, which is taking place in the south of Belgium in a really small town called Hufaliz. Ooh, we got that right. Did I get it right? Yes, I think so. And my guest is a really old friend of mine. Well, he's not old. I've known him for a long time. Well, maybe he is old. I don't yes, know. He is old. He's a, someone I've known for a very long time. He's a professor at Stanford University School of Medicine. Harry Greenberg, welcome. Thank you. Been wanting to get you on TWIV for a long time. Well, and here we time. are. Yes. Uh, at a double-stranded RNA meeting, where, by the way, last I looked, it's 12 degrees Celsius and partly cloudy. No, no. It now looks quite sunny out there. Partly sunny. All right. We'll call it partly sunny. <laughs> In New York, about now it's 20 Celsius, and in other places it's warmer, so it was a bit of a shock getting here. We have a little audience. Let me ask you, audience, who does not work on double-stranded RNA viruses? No one. One person. He does. Oh. I know he doesn't. <laughs> he doesn't. Yeah. Oh, do. I don't. I don't. I don't. Yes, <laughs> yes I don't. Yeah. That's pretty good. I was at the retrovirus meeting recently, and I said, who works on HIV? They all raised their hands, and I said, who doesn't? And about four people work on other retroviruses, which... So here it's not the case. Have you been to every one of these meetings? Yes, I, I could be the... No, Mary, is Mary Estes in the room? No. I think Mary and I are the only two living people who have been at every all meeting? the DSRNA meetings. Yeah, I asked John Coffin. <laughs> uh, it's the same for, for the retrovirus meetings. He's been to every one. I think they're up to 44 or something like that. Yeah, this that's is just every the year. 13th. All right, Harry, we're going to, this is all about you this episode. You've had a long and amazing career, and I want to start all the way in the beginning and talk a little bit about where you're from and your training, and then we'll talk about some of your science. Does that sound like a good sure. plan? Where are you from? Well, for those of you who have, um, who speak English is, and especially who come from the United States, it should be obvious where I'm from, which is New York. Um, the, I, have, uh, I haven't lived in New York since 1972, but it seems that I got imprinted and uh, haven't been able to lose my accent. So I grew up born in New York City, spent the first three years of my life in the Bronx, which is one of the um, people's boroughs in New York. And then my parents moved to Westchester County, which is a suburban area of New York, and I grew up in Westchester in a town called Rye, um, and then uh, in high school, I went to the public schools in Rye in high school. Um, my parents were middle class. Um, my father got ill at a young age, and we slowly slipped down into lower middle class as, as his illness progressed. But my grandmother had some money, so I went to a private school in New York called Fieldston, which is a, a well-known... Uh, Robert Oppenheimer was its most famous graduate. Yeah, you were. Yeah, no, not quite. <laughs> but in any case, so that's my um, early career. I went to an Ivy League college called Dartmouth. When I went there, um, it was an all-men's school. Again, for those of you who um, know movies, the movie Animal House was really made about Dartmouth College. John Belushi. John Belushi, my hero. Um, was he modeled after you? Uh, uh, no. <laughs> um, but I tried to model myself after him. Were you a good student? I mean, it's a good school, so you must have been good in I high school. Was, right? No, I, wa I was uh, thought of... Uh, my, the rap on me was that I was lazy in high school. Um, and uh, I had a girlfriend in my first year at college at another place, and we were having, uh, um, we weren't getting on well, and so I did very poorly my first year at Dartmouth. Dartmouth was an all-male school up in the woods. It was a place that um, 
substance abuse was a place that it encouraged. It encouraged substance abuse, and I got right with it. <laughs> so, it's the same so, today, Harry. It hasn't changed. Uh, uh, no, it's... Uh, not with actually, you. Not with you. I mean college. Uh, actually, so in any case, I went to Dartmouth. I graduated. Did you go as a pre-med, by the way? N n I was a sem... Um, I thought I would be a lawyer, but right. as a safety, I took the pre-med courses, but I was a history major. I was not a science type. I, I think I would have been a better lawyer than a doctor pre-med, mm -hmm. but um, I did do well in organic lab. That's, uh, um, <laughs> I actually did amazingly well there. So, uh, when you graduated, you went right to medical school, right? The, uh, again, uh, this is important and it'll come up tomorrow in my talk, but I graduated college in 1966. Viet the Vietnam War was just beginning to heat up in the United States then. And there was a draft. So I don't know how many of you live in countries where there's a draft, but when I went to medical school, um, they, I would not be drafted because I was in medical school, but the Army wanted physicians, so there was a high likelihood that I would get drafted after I graduated medical school. I, uh, and part of the reason I'm a scientist was draft evasion, which I, <laughs> which I practiced very intently. So right out of Dartmouth, you went to medical school? Yeah, to Columbia, Vince's right. alma mater. Before I was there, though. Well before you were there. <laughs> <laughs> what years were you there? I was there 66 to 70, and I met my wife um, there. Did you know Harold knew? I knew Harold knew very well, and in fact, the research I did in medical school was done in the lab in the Black Building. I don't know if is that still it's there. It's still there. Yeah. The Black <laughs> Building was a brand new research building when I was there, right next door to Harold's lab. I mentioned Harold knew he was the chief of ID. He's a legendary ID person who, I think, really developed the idea when when people came in with infectious diseases, he asked them where they'd been. Yes. And, and people didn't used to do that before, and he made a practice of it, and was it real? He was a right? great um, ID doc, and, and, and uh, you know, this was the 60s, and infectious disease research then was mostly antimicrobial resistance. That's, that was 90% of it. Infectious disease docs frequently ran the, the lab, and it was heavily bacterial in its focus, not virus. Well, so you, you, then you finished medical school. Did you do a residency somewhere? Yeah, I did, but I, you'll hear tomorrow. I, I am concerned that this talk is going to overlap my talk tomorrow. Only but 10 it, people here. It doesn't yes, matter. That's, that's, <laughs> that is good. Um, that, but in any case, um, just for those, so I, I want to be a doctor, um, mostly because my mother said to me, you got to make money when you grow up and uh, <laughs> you need a trade. And so um, that's why I didn't uh, become a historian. But I was told the, the rumor in medical school was that if you wanted a good residency, once you graduate medical school, you, you get more training and it's called a residency in the U.S. And at that point, they said, well, if you do research, you'll get a good residency. Mm -hmm. So I went around and I worked on hepatitis B, and you'll hear about that experiment that we did in medical school in 1968. Um, and that was useful because it was a good experiment, and uh, I, I enjoyed it. I had never done research before. Where did you do a residency? At Bellevue Hospital. Again, I think there are many people in the audience that don't know Bellevue Hospital. It is... There's a wonderful book written last year called Bellevue about Bellevue Hospital, which is the fundamental public hospital of New York City. Started in this early 17th century, always a hospital for the poor of New York City, and also a hospital that was founded on the principle no patient could ever be turned away, which is a wonderful principle when you work there it can become a little overpowering because the point was Bellevue was not allowed to be filled up. If every hallway had stretchers in it, it would, they'd keep packing them in. So it was, a, it was sort of like um, 
for those of you who've ever watched the, the TV program MASH, Bellevue was like the equivalent of MASH. And you were a gastroenterology resident? No, I was just a regular Man. doctor, yeah. You, the, you know, there were no professors there. They just throw you in and say, yeah. you're the doctor. All right, and after, how long was that? <laughs> was that two, two years. years. And um, at Bellevue, well, you could, get, you could get your credentials for being a real doctor in two years at that point because the war was on and they wanted people to get drafted. So if, you, if, people, if your boss thought highly of you at the hospital, he would credential you as an internist, which was what I was. And then um, another ploy to stay out of going to Vietnam is if you were lucky enough to get into the National Institute of Health, that was like being in the army. You were in the army, but you were in the public health service. So that was the most competitive event of my life, was getting into the National Institute of Health, as opposed to getting into the real army and going to Vietnam. And you were there for quite a while, right? I was there for two years, um, just two years. And then I had done my army duty, mm -hmm. and I thought, well, I'm going to go practice medicine now. Um, mm -hmm. And so we went to California, because we had never been to California, and my wife and I said, We'll go spend two years learning how to be a gastroenterologist in California, and then we'll come back to New York and I'll practice medicine. And I won't tell you a lot more, but I had a great research experience, even though it was only a year in California. But Diane, my wife, didn't like California. How is that possible? Um, she didn't like it because I was too cheap to buy her a car to commute to work. So she had a big, uh, big commute. So. Um, I called up my boss at the NIH. So um, one of them, Vince and I talked a little bit um, before this, and we were talking about careers. And I think both of us said, you know, what's important in a career other than um, chance, which is an incredible part of a career. And the other is mentors. And almost everybody you meet who is successful will have incredibly warm, or maybe angry feelings about a mentor, but a mentor who helped them in some way. And so my NIH mentor, for all of you who are rotaviruses, is, the original mentor was a guy named Bob Chanick, who discovered RSV, discovered parainfluenza 3, discovered mycoplasma pneumonia, his lab discovered hepatitis A, blah, blah, blah. Um, and um, he, Vince, you knew him. Um, I did, yeah. He had he deteriorated mentally uh, late in his career, but when I first knew him, which is the early 70s, I can honestly say he knew every paper ever written about virology. You couldn't, um, this was pre-molecular biology, but you couldn't come up with something where he didn't know the paper, know the paper that preceded it, know where the person who wrote it was trained. It was, uh, and he, was hypomanic. He had, I'm sure, a, a true psychiatric diagnosis of hypomania, which, which is a very useful disease if you want to work all the time and love it. <laughs> you don't have that, do you? Um, I clearly have picked up traits of Bob. Um, he would do, um, he, he had, um, and I see John Patton there who was in, the, in that lab too, trolling for data. So this was a huge laboratory, and every day he would wander through the laboratory. He, he need, it was like the feed me, feed me. I mean, he, and, he, and you would want to be able to give him a tidbit of data, or you know, he was displeased when he came by your bench. So everybody would try to work hard to have something new each day to tell Chanik. Um, so how, how many years were you at NIH? So I was before? two years at Stanford and then back at and, the and NIH for almost eight more years. And then back to Stanford. And then back, to, and, and I would have stayed at the NIH for my life, mm -hmm. but Ronald Reagan got elected president of the United States. I don't know what your politics are, but he was not my first choice. Um, and... Um, he um, brought in a new, um, sec all new government, including the, uh, the Secretary of the Interior, where my wife worked, 
and my wife had a political appointment and all political appointments whenever there's a change in the United States they all get fired right. and so she lost her job and Stanford had tried to recruit me before and so we went back to California okay that's where you are now yes since 83 all right so we'll come back to to that to career issues later but I want to talk a little bit about science and Harry's published 335 papers it's amazing and we're going to go over baseball, every one <laughs> baseball so just uh, you know I've thought about this and and again there's people from many different countries here in the United States, baseball is a famous sport. It's, one, it's the national pastime. And baseball, is, more than any other sport, is a sport of statistics. So they keep statistics on everything that every player does. You, you know that. And it dawned on me that many of the statistics are longevity-based. Total number of home runs. Total number of, of runs batted in etc cetera, etc cetera. and that is also what he just said 300 and something papers well if you live long enough you'll write 300 and something papers <laughs> and um, and it sounds you know uh, my first paper was in 1968 I'd been writing papers for 50 years uh, I see everybody's young here you you don't got 50 years of writing papers they so, will they will they will uh, God willing you let's, will. so let's we can't do every one obviously so Let's do a few areas, and let's start with that first paper in 1968. In fact, you had a bunch of papers on hepatitis and Australia antigen, and I know you're going to talk about this tomorrow, but, you know, a lot more people will hear this okay. once it's released. Just tell us what that was so all about. So, do, do, can I ask a question of the yeah, audience? Yeah, of course. How many people in the audience know what Australia antigen is? Okay, so there's a lot who don't know. Um... So, uh, in the 60s, uh, a, a geneticist named Barry Blumberg, um, this could be a little long-winded, but they should know how a, a Nobel Prize was won. Um, Barry Blumberg, who was a purely a geneticist, reasoned that there would be polymorphisms of serum proteins that existed, and one way he could detect the polymorphisms in a population would be to take blood from a hemophiliac who had been transfused with millions of transfusions. And his assumption was that person will make antibodies to unusual protein structures that are polymorphic. And he could use that hemophiliac antibody to screen. And so he was doing that. And he came across, and he was doing it in a test called Octorlone gel diffusion. Um, I'm sure none of you know what that is, but, but old people do. Um, yes. Um, but you put you, one sir uh, you, in jello, you put an antibody in a hole in the jello here and an antigen in the hole in the jello there. They diffuse through the jello, and when they get a critical concentration, they precipitate, and there's actually a line. And it's a slick technique, actually. Um, uh, it, so. If you have this hemophiliac sura, you put it in the jello, and you put the other person's serum in. And he found a precipitation line in a couple of Australian aboriginals. Um, and he called it Australia antigen. And then he found it in young children in, uh, who were mentally retarded and housed um, in institutions. And he found it in some people with malignancy. And nobody knew what it was, but it was called Australia antigen. And I'm not sure who, there was a thought that maybe it was related to an infectious agent, but nobody knew. And again, this is very early um, 60s. So, and I do mention this in my talk. I found uh, the person I was going to do research with was a young professor. He, he had a really good hemophiliac antisera and it gave beautiful precipitin lines. And he said, why don't you, Greenberg, go up to the blood bank, <coughs> take the little type and cross tube, you know, whenever you get a blood transfusion, they see whether your blood is the same or different from the, the blood they're gonna transfuse you with, because if it's a different type, it makes you very sick. Um, so collect all the type and cross tubes from people who have gotten transfused 
bring them down to the lab and put them in this test and see whether they have Australia antigen in them. So that's what I did. And of course, some, most people didn't and some people did. And then um, my job was to find the people who got the Australia antigen and find controls and see what happened. And I'll show you all tomorrow, but guess what? If you got Australia antigen, you had a high chance of getting hepatitis, really bad. And so that was like Koch, somebody mentioned Koch's postulates today or yesterday. That was the beginning of Koch's postulates that uh, this is a, you know, you get this, you, it transmits disease. But you left and, out the good part. You had a car that- uh, I'm not gonna give it, come on, it's my- Yeah, it's yeah, you have to, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> So the best part of this was, I'm so, I'm 20 or something like that. He had, again, there are many, from many different, Ford made an incredibly cool sports car right around this time called the Mustang. And he had a red convertible Mustang, a really hot car. I didn't have a car. And he would give me the keys and because I had to find these people who had gotten transfused. So I would be bombing all over Manhattan and, and northern New Jersey, ringing doorbells in his hot convertible. <laughs> that was my first research equipment. And when the people, op <laughs> and when the people opened the door... We, somebody would open the door and you, I don't know if you, you're jaundiced. If you really, if you have hepatitis, your eyes turn yellow. And sometimes you don't know it. Um, it's amazing how many people don't see their eyes, the sclera, and realize that they've turned yellow. And I'd ring a doorbell and some man or a woman would open it and look at her like pumpkins. Um, <laughs> and I'd say, are you okay? I said, I'm not feeling so well. <laughs> So you did not figure out it was a virus, though, right? Um, I think, yes. I, you know, this, is, this was a very early, um, very early in virology, actually. And um, it was assumed that, actually, it was initially assumed that that antigen was a virus. Mm -hmm. It was only later, you know, that hepatitis makes its surface coat protein in immense excess. Um, so you could do viral diagnostics for hepatitis B looking for a protein in the serum. You can't do that with any other um, virus, basically. It's, it, was like, it was like PCR before PCR. All right, so let's, one more question on this era, and then we'll move on. So when you heard later that it was a virus and it was causing hep B, did you think back, ah, I missed that? Or, or how did you react? No, I, uh, no. Um, like I can't do this. I, I had one, you, you, you asking me what I did in, uh, I had one other incident with hepatitis B and that is when I went to Stanford, um, I was learning how to be a gastroenterologist and I was working with, um, Bill Robbins, uh, you do research and I was working with a guy named Bill Robinson. I, I was looking out there, there, everybody's so young. Um, Bill Robinson was the scientist that found the DNA polymerase in the hepatitis B virus, so a very important discovery. So he had a polymerase assay, but next door to him was a guy named Tom Merrigan, who was an early interferon, clinical interferon researcher, and he had access to the Finnish Red Cross would purify interferon from human cells and give it to people. So this is not recombinant interferon. This is a pr blood product interferon. And Tom Merrigan came over to me in Bill Robinson's lab and said, hey, in the clinic, do you have any patients with chronic hepatitis? And I said, sure, I got a lot of them. And he said, let's give them interferon. And I have no memory of an IRB or, <laughs> or per, I, I, I mean, there must have been, but I have no memory of it. Three patients we treated with interferon I still remember the first one. I still remember her name, a hippie in Santa Cruz who experimented, <laughs> experimented with IV drugs and got chronic hepatitis. And we cured her. The first patient that's published cured of hepatitis B with an antiviral. The second person, they switched their, their serology, which is the second type of response. And the third patient had no response. And therein started the interferon business. Um, you know, $10 billion later, those were the three outcomes that you could have. 
cool. That's a great story. I love it. Yeah. Now, also buried in those early papers is one of mycoplasma. Where is that coming from? Uh, so when I went to the NIH initially, I had worked on hepatitis, but I went to Bob Chanek's lab, and he had discovered uh, mycoplasma pneumoniae. Most of his lab was doing virology, and he couldn't find anybody to continue the work on mycoplasma. And so he said, Greenberg, you're working on mycoplasma. I said, I don't want to work on mycoplasma. And he said, you want to go to Vietnam or you want to work on mycoplasma? <laughs> Basically, that was the conversation. So, so I, ma I made a bunch of temperature-sensitive mutants to mycoplasma pneumoniae for, to try to make okay. a vaccine. Okay. You also have a bunch of early papers on Norwalk gastroenteritis. In fact, quite a few epidemiology outbreak yeah, studies. Is Mary here? No, she, Mary's not here. She'll hear you later. So, what, what so, is that about? Al Kapikian, I'm looking right at, uh, and I see Linda safe there. Al Kapikian is worked in the same lab. Al was my direct boss. He reported to Bob Chanik. When I went back to the NIH, I was a trained gastroenterologist, and so I figured just at that time, both um, Rhoda and Noro had just been discovered. Al Kapikian had discovered um, uh, Noro and had, had done early work in the discovery of Rhoda. So I went to that section and um, do, who knows what immune electron microscopy is? I know that Barbara does, a bunch of you do. Al Kapikian discovered Noro with immune electron microscopy that he learned from June Almeida, who is a, a well-known British, yeah, long gone. But in any case, so the only serologic way of understanding norovirus infection when it was first discovered was to take serum from somebody, add it to a stool specimen that had norovirus in it, look under an electron microscope for two hours, and see whether you could see antibody molecules stuck to the norovirus. I hated that. that, that I, but in order to be part of the papers and part of the research, I had to sit next to Al, who talked always about baseball for like hours and hours. And I don't know if you've ever done this, but if you're looking in a microscope and somebody else is driving it, you get seasick. Um, and so, so, so I, I was smart enough to reason there's got to be a better assay. So we, we, we had stools and I purified norovirus out of feces and figured out how to make a radioimmunoassay um, that could measure antibody norovirus with purified. And, I, and that also led to purifying the virion and saying it looked like it had a single structural protein of about 60 kilodaltons. So that was the first um, uh, hint that norovirus was related to Khaleesi viruses. But, but it, Mary cleaned my clock okay. and cloned it. <laughs> now, so, so that's how I got out of it. <laughs> okay, so, and then if, if you look at your CV in the early 1980s, there's a switch to rotavirus. Yeah. And that's, a, I would characterize that as your, the love of your scientific life, right? Yes, and I, I, I wasn't going to tell this story tomorrow, so I'll simply say uh, in the, um, when the Laboratory of Infectious Disease was working on rotavirus, initially human rotaviruses were not cultivatable. There were some tricks to how to cultivate them. And that laboratory was heavily vested in making vaccines. And it was very quickly realized that rotaviruses were important. Um, and um, the, uh, so Bob Chanak, who ran everything, was crazy with wanting to be able to understand the serology of human rotaviruses. And all he had were some animal rotaviruses that grew more easily. And so be, because that lab also worked on flu, they were very well versed in reassortment. And he wanted to make reassortants between a cultivatable animal virus and a non-cultivatable human rotavirus. And he figured he could rescue the, the right genes. And so he brought Bernie Fields, the many, I mean, I don't know the real virus people here. Bernie Fields came down, he was a relatively young man there, but he was Mr. Reassortment. And what's the fastest way we could do this experiment? And Bernie, it was a bad, it was a bad idea. 
He said, he said, well, you can mutagenize the animal rotavirus with um, x-ray, with uh, x-ray mutations, and you'll get single genes and you'll get temperature sensitive, you'll get, you know, rather than having to do classic mutagenesis. So since I was a low man on the totem pole, I was not given that project. That went to somebody else, and it was total failure, never worked. And I went about just using 5-FU and other mutagens to make a, a library of TS mutants of animal rotavirus and then using restrictive temperatures and rescuing human rotavirus. Yeah. And okay. that led to serology. So uh, let's spend some time talking about rotavirus vaccines because you've published a lot on them. Yeah. And we need to talk about a couple of different areas. One is when did you or the field realize that there was a medical need for a rotavirus vaccine? Well, very quickly. Um, the, the, so just like hepatitis B um, was the epidemiology was worked out very quickly because it made so much of this surface antigen that you could identify chronically infected people. Rotavirus is shed in industrial strength amounts. So for those of you who don't know, 10, 10 to the 10th to 10 to the 11th particles per gram of stool. When you look at a rotavirus containing stool under the electron microscope, you sort of say, where's the stool? It looks like a, it looks like a crystalline array of virus. So um, uh, the, the, what we say in the field is the fecal veneer of the globe. Um, you know, in Bangladesh, the fecal veneer is quite thick. In where I live, Palo Alto, California, very ritzy little town, the fecal veneer is very thin. But that veneer has tons of rotavirus in it everywhere. There's an, you, if you go out here and rub and just rub your, your hand on the ground and then do PCR, you'll get some rotavirus genes. We're, we're, we're living in a sea of rotavirus. So very quickly, solid phase immunoassays were developed. This is well before PCR. And they were extremely sensitive in detecting. And actually, the first ELISA, I think, ever used to do epidemiology was in the laboratory of infectious disease for rotavirus, where they actually made a little ELISA machine, and a guy named Bob Yolkin, uh, very you know, published a hundred papers in a week, um, doing doing <laughs> serology uh, and viral detection using an ELISA. Also, uh, you must have started thinking about serotypes, as we used to call them. Oh, this, you remember that name? No, I know it's a people lot. People don't use serotypes, serotypes anymore. They, well, like we used to because people don't want to do neutralization assays. But I do a lot of neutralization. So people want to look at the sequence and say yes. what genotype it is. But when did you, you had to address that to make a vaccine? So, right? yes and no. I'm I'm looking at a uh, a, a uh, representative of one of the major vaccine companies. Um, so, one, it is a normal human trait of many people to want to characterize individual things. And virology naturally selects for people who are classification intense. Um, and so the history of virology is serology in large part. And then this one is this serotype, this one is this serotype, and how do they differ? Um, and Al Kapikian, my boss, before he got into um, rotavirus and norovirus, was a rhino guy. And so if you ever tried to do rhino serotypes, they stopped at 120 because they couldn't count anymore. Um, but they, rhino virologists love serotypes. So there was big focus on serotypes and big focus on serotypes for vaccines. However, the epidemiology very early, very, very early was, it's a disease of young children, and basically the disease, everybody in the world has had rotavirus by the age of two to three, maybe four occasionally, but, and, and then you're more or less immune to severe disease. And all of a sudden you say, boy, there's a boatload of serotypes out there. How did you get immune to all of those so quickly? And so, I used to have immense arguments with Al 
because he felt that, yeah, you know, if all the serotypes, you need lots of serotypes in a vaccine. And in fact, a major, there are two vaccines that are worldwide marketed for rotavirus. Both are very successful. Um, both work quite very well in the developed world. One is based on the thought that you need a lot of serotypes. The other is based on the thought you don't need a lot of serotypes. Both work very well. You, you conclude whether you need a lot of serotypes well, or not. Well, Al's, <laughs> <laughs> but Al's, concern, Al's concern came from a good place because before we knew there were three serotypes of polio, people tried making a vaccine yes. with one, and then people still got polio, right? So he was... was that, well, but then the epidemiology told him that yes, you, I, you didn't get immune. Sure. You could get polio twice. And, mm -hmm. you know, serotypes, are, you get flu every couple of years. Um, through your whole life. Got you it. get Got measles it. once. Okay. So my next question is, you're probably going to have the same answer. And it is, did we know the correlates of protection? No. And so we didn't care. We just made a vaccine. Right. That's how most vaccines have been made. But, um, but um, it's something part of my talk tomorrow will cover. So I believe there is a huge amount of data that, especially for acute viral infections, antibody that kills that virus or suppresses its replication in cell culture generally correlates with protective state of the animal or individual. So viral neutralization tests have um, a really long history of being good correlates of protection. Um, but sometimes they don't work as well as other times. For rotavirus, if you don't have any antibody to rotavirus, you're not protected. That, that, so that, so, there's a, so it, if you just do it that way, no antibody, no protection, antibody, some level of protection. But, but having a, an amount correlating with protection has been very hard to determine for rotavirus. So yes, they, people just went ahead and figured we'll let, infect some people with an attenuated virus and see whether they're protected, and they were. Yeah, well, it's, it's an, the low-hanging vaccines, right, on the tree are all the ones where the antibody is protective, but you know, like an HIV vaccine, we're not, we don't oh, know the correlates screwed. and we're screwed. Well, yeah. yes, we are, but um, just for all of you, I mean, I'm, I'm too old. But respiratory syncytial virus is sitting out there, terrible virus for very young children, um, complicated, more complicated, but um, maybe antibody does work and maybe yeah. it was just for that virus, nobody knew how to make the right antibody. It's not clear that they do now, but maybe they do. Well, we, I heard some cool work recently where they're now thinking of immunizing pregnant mothers, so the antibodies will cross the placenta and protect the babies we, I, I just, so they can be immunized, I, right? Yes. So just to digress to RSV, because some of you are young and, and maybe not stuck on one virus for the rest of your life, um, but um, respiratory syncytial virus, it is interesting from an immune standpoint because it really, um, half of the burden of disease occurs in the first three months of life, more or less. So, you re so you're up against it because in, at that time, it's hard to immunize um, young children. And much of their protection comes from passive transfer of antibody from the moms. And there was a paper, a couple of papers written in the last several years. Everybody's afraid to immunize pregnant women because you don't want to do anything to pregnant women because then you're gonna, if something bad happens, you're blamed, um, sometimes correctly, sometimes not. But for flu, it has been shown that if you immunize pregnant women for influenza, you have a beneficial effect. Uh, so people are thinking about that. And then what you will do is get the baby a little bit older before you have right. to immunize yeah. it. Yeah. It's cool. So you worked on a lot of rotavirus vaccines in your career. You've published papers on all different types, DNA, subunit, attenuated, what were you thinking? Just try everything? Just publish as much as you can. <laughs> um, I, um, <laughs> the, um, 
thinking first live. So I was involved in the initial work on um, live attenuated rotavirus vaccines, actually reassortant vaccines. So, and I was talking about this to Vince and somebody else mentioned host range uh, restriction. So rotaviruses, unlike rheoviruses, every mammalian species, we just had another one where there's like the, the um, the, uh, every mammalian species has its rotavirus. It causes diarrhea in the young naturally of that species. The species is then protected more or less as it's older against rotavirus infection. And yet um, th those animal rotaviruses, which you all eat on a daily basis because of the fecal veneer, um, you're, you don't get infected with them. So it has, host, has relatively severe host range restrictive barriers. So it's a very, so I'm gonna digress for one second if you don't mind. So model systems, I'm gonna editorial. So models are great and we've had a lot of talks um, to already about models. And I think the key to models is understanding what your model is good for and what are the potential weaknesses. And animal models, so m mouse, we heard lots of, I, I, at some level, I'm a mouse doctor. Um, but I, I like to make the point that mouse, mice, uh, the first rotavirus ever discovered was a mouse rotavirus. And it was discovered because the mouse house at Yale was being decimated by a diarrheal disease that was killing all the pups. And a virologist I had never knew named Elizabeth Kraft actually reasoned that it was a virus, reasoned that it was in the feces, and the reason all your mouse cages has, have sort of tops on them where things can't get volatilized out is because she stopped the epidemic by containing the mouse thing. And then that was later realized to be a murine rotavirus. So murine rotavirus in a mouse isn't really a model. It's, it is rotaviral disease causing diarrhea in uh, infant mice. If I give a human rotavirus to a mouse, I can get 10 to the eighth viral particles, uh, uh, viral titer into the mouse and I, and I can give it diarrhea. And I can stop that diarrhea with an antibody to the human rotavirus. And I'll show you that slide tomorrow. But it's not quite as good a model, right? For one case, one place I can use one infectious particle and create the disease. The other I need 10 to the 7th. It's different. All right, so you, this was all because I asked you about... I know, it got crazy. That's okay. <laughs> and uh, you were going to, I think, talk about the use of animal rotaviruses and making human vaccines. Well, so there's host range restrictions. So, the, so this wasn't my idea. I don't know whose it was, uh, Chanix or Alcapickians. The thought was, like Jenner, maybe you could take, and, and early experiments were done in, in, in um, uh, cattle, actually, in, uh, where you could infect a cow intrauterinely with one type of rotavirus and then challenge it like a human rotavirus and challenge it with a, a virulent cow rotavirus when the, the cow was born and there was protection. And so the reasoning was that there, that all those restrictions that maybe a non-homologous, non-human rotavirus will replicate a little bit in a human, cause disease, cause in, uh, immunity, but not cause disease. And that has turned out to be um, true. <clears throat> Were you involved in any of the licensed rotavirus vaccines? Yeah. Which um, well, it depends what you mean. I picked the plaques of... That's pretty involved. <laughs> <laughs> I picked the plaques. Well, to tell you how long this takes, there's a recent uh, rotavirus vaccine in India called Rotacil made. Um, and I think two of the five um, uh, types of in that uh, pentavalent vaccine, I think I picked those plaques. Mm -hmm. And I picked all the plaques of the Rotashield vaccine that was then caused into susception. So Rotashield was an attenuated reassortant? Yes, it was a monkey rotavirus that was reassorted with a human rotavirus. Um, a, gr a really good story for you all to read. Um, worked up, 
It was attenuated. It was very immunogenic. It got licensed in the United States. It was made by Wyeth, which was then a big drug company that um, subsequently bought by Pfizer, an even bigger drug company. But, um, and in fact, if you're John, I'm looking at John, and we have some other graduates of the NIH here. If you invent something for the federal government in the United States, you can get some patent rights. And I had patent rights to that vaccine, a little, which paid for, because it was marketed for a year, for me redoing our garden in Palo Alto. <laughs> but then, but then interception came and it was taken off the market. So that was the end of that. Um, but um, so this, this virus, this vaccine, caused, was associated with intussusception. And intussusception is the most common surgical emergency of infants in the world. And do you know what it is? Do you all know what it is? I'm seeing nodding, okay. What about our listeners? Oh, what about, so, <laughs> yeah, sorry. Um, um, if you think of your, when you take off your socks, if you push the sock inside the sock, it, your small intestine, the classic intussusception, your small intestine herniates into the large intestine. So you're sort of um, involuting it. The problem with intussusception is that the blood vessels that, that, that um, nourish that piece of intestine that herniates into the large intestine gets squished. And so if, it, if the intussusception lasts long enough, you necrose a piece of bowel and you die. Um, actually, in the United States, nobody dies from, from intussusception now because you can diagnose it with ultrasound very easily. And they, uh, this is a little off color, but not a lot. The way they reduce it, rather than um, operating, which is what they would do in India, is they just insert um, um, something into the anus of the baby and pump a little air in, in and it pops it open. And it's simple. It. <laughs> Low-tech solution. Yeah. Yes. Um, but we used to do surgery, but that's, that's gone now, right? In the United States, yeah. surgery for interception is, van you know, maybe two or three in the country yeah. a year. Okay. In, in other places, very common. So the, the Rota Shield was associated with that. So it was taken off the market and it's never been back on again. N ne uh, not, not commercially back on. The key question is, and so um, both, um, I'll mention the names because I'm not, both Merck and GSK had vaccines. And because of the intussusception, they were forced by the FDA and the, I think the European regulatory agencies to do immense safety studies to prove that their vaccines were safe because of the worry of intussusception. Unheard of sizes, something like 70,000 people um, in a safety study, which costs a ton. Um, and those vaccines look safe as can be. Subsequently, there have been a bunch of studies that are population studies, like all of Australia. Um, so that's a population <laughs> study because the vac vaccines are used there. And it turns out it looks like all, at least those two vaccines, if you have enough people, you'll see there's a little more intussusception in children that get vaccination than not. And you can see that the in, that little blip in intussusception is temporally related to the vaccination. But since then, there's been so much data on the, the benefit of the vaccine that um, um, there's not, a, there really is not a concern. When the rhesus rotavirus vaccine, the Wyeth vaccine came out, there was no good population-based data on what good it might be doing. So right now, what vaccines are being used and what, what kind are there? Well, there, there is um, one of those manufacturers makes a human rotavirus vaccine that was attenuated presumably by multiple passage in okay. cell culture. Okay. That's sold all over the world and sold in large amounts and it works very well in, let's say, in Finland or Western Europe or in the United States, works somewhat less well in Latin America, but still very well. 
and works somewhat less well than that in uh, Bangladesh or Africa. But still, it, it saves many more lives in Bangladesh or India or Africa than in the United States because so many more children die. Then there's another one that is based on a reassortment between bovine and human rotavirus that sold a lot in the United States, um, and that's highly effective too. Then there's recently been one that I helped um, develop um, as an advisor in India that is an Indian, it's a rotavirus isolated in India. It, 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 it's a long story, so I won't go into it, but it, it, it is an isolate from a newborn nursery and epidemiologically children who got infected naturally did not get sick. And that now is licensed in India um, and seems to be similar to the other two, at least in India. And then there's another reassortant vaccine that was originally made at the NIH um, that I made it a help make at the same time as the rhesus that was just um, uh, put out by a very big uh, vaccine company in India. And then there's a vaccine in Indonesia that is that. Um, and come on, what what other ones have I missed? That's that's okay. That's okay. I, I think that's, so. There's a, a lot, lot of them. There's a lot. So, and I I suppose we don't understand why they don't work in some places, but nobody understands why in the less developed world, for sure, they work less well. And it almost certainly is multifactorial. Um, but they certainly don't work as well. And so there's a big push for maybe a parenterally uh, administered vaccine, like polio. You, you know better than anybody here. Um, in, in some places in India, you gotta give, what, polio 20 times to, get, uh, to make people immune to polio, the Sabin vaccine? Yeah, that's correct. And But there's no more polio in India, so that's great. It's good, yes. <laughs> it's, they, wiped, they wiped it out. It's great. But <laughs> I mean, the good thing is it's not injected, so it's not a big deal in many ways, although logistically it is. All right, we have, we have about 10 minutes. Let me touch on uh, two other things. One that I'm, I'm interested in, and probably others are, you, you at one point went to a company and did a lot of work with them, Aviron, and you published Averon. You know, these fake names, you can't mispronounce them in my view, but <laughs> <laughs> they're just made up names, right? So, so's Harry. There's like, they're, they're like um, all the drug names, which you can't pronounce. Yes, what does it matter, be, yeah. right? Averon? Averon. All right. Uh, and you published actually a lot of papers. Your name is on papers yeah, about no. influenza. So why did you go? Uh, you didn't physically go, or did you take yeah, a no, leave? No, I took it to a leave why, of absence. Why did you get involved with them? So um, a part of my life, which is not important, I was the, to you guys, uh, I was the uh, dean of research at Stanford Medical School for a long time. Um, three deans. Uh, I reported to three separate deans. Uh, Vince knows what a dean is, and, bleh, and uh, he hasn't had to report to three of them directly. Um, so, they, you know, they're, um, you don't get to be a dean of a medical school without being at least at one level a piece of work. Um, but in any case, we were about to select a new dean, and whenever a new dean comes in, you know, they should choose their um, number twos and number threes. And at the same time, um, there was a startup company nearby that was um, working on a live attenuated influenza vaccine. Um, anybody here from the University of Michigan? No. Uh, invented by a man named John Massab. You may know John Massab. When I was a grad student, I got his viruses uh, yes. to work on, yeah. The so, cold adapted virus. Yes. yes. So John Massab had the concept of making cold adapted temperature sensitive influenza so that it would replicate in the nose but couldn't replicate deeper in the body in the respiratory tree so it was restricted from being virulent. The first paper on that virus was published in 1962 I think. The virus was still around it the uh, like 1999, still not licensed, and there was a company locally that had taken it up and was trying to get it licensed. And 
Interestingly, I had been the chairman of the FDA Advisory Committee on Vaccines and Other Biologics, so they thought I knew something about vaccines. So it was, an, it was a natural thing for me to take a leave of absence from Stanford, go to a company, um, get out of my dean job. Um, I wouldn't be conflicted because I wasn't employed by Stanford. And in the U.S., Many universities actually allow faculty to take a a leave of absence for a year or two years. They let you keep your lab space there, and then if you want to come back, you can come back, and if you don't, you don't, which is what Stanford did. So it was great. I had a wonderful time. Um, And I'll tell you afterwards, because I don't want to take too much time, but but, um, Peter Palazzi, who is, I know, a mentor of yours, is one of the founders of Haveron. And the reason he is a founder is because just by serendipity, the the guy who had the money to start Haveron sat next to me at a meeting. I didn't know him, he didn't know me. I was asked a question, I answered it, and at the end of the meeting, he turned to me and said, I'm Joe Blow, I wanna start a company on flu, you sound like you know something, who should I talk to? I, was, I said, you need to talk to Peter Palazzi. Great. So the moral is, if someone asks you to be on a committee, do it. Because you never know when the What's guy, gonna who's going to sit next to you and want to start a company. So the outcome of that was flu mist, right? Flu mist, which was t- been taken off and now back being sold. Yeah. Okay. Um, so. Yes. Where's Yelly? Is it? Yelly. Yeah, right yes. The, you know. Vince, this, I know this is supposedly be about me, but really it's about you. Um, you are, this has all been a ruse to, for us, the double-stranded RNA people, to make a little presentation for you. It's, we went out of our way <laughs> to fool you. <laughs> so here we are. Oh, we, like, haven't, we haven't finished, we haven't no, finished the podcast told, yet, I, but, oh, okay, I'll take a presentation. There's a little for your 10-year anniversary. Well, thank so. you. It's lovely. Look, it's viruses. Huh, isn't that pretty? Yeah. Thank you. Well, I, I guess that means we should wrap this up. I want to ask you one more question. Um, I had more here, but we'll save it for uh, another time. Um, yeah, when I have 600 papers. No, no. <laughs> it's, it's actually fine right now, but... Um, if you hadn't, I, I think I know the answer, but let me ask you anything. If you hadn't been a, a scientist, what would you have done? I think I would have been a historian. Yeah? Yeah, I was good at it. I mean, I was better at that. Um, I, I, or a lawyer, um, uh, you know, my mother would have said, be a lawyer, not a historian, because you can't make any money as a historian. <laughs> um uh, probably, yeah, one of those two. You wouldn't I, have been a doctor in Scarsdale? Or oh, West? if I hadn't been a scientist, once I went to medical school, I was going to be a doctor. I, um, yes, and if it hadn't been for the Vietnam War, I would be a doctor. Hmm. Um, and I would have been fine. I was a doctor for a long time. Yeah. Along, okay. but, yeah. I, can I tell them a story about, which may be embarrassing to you? Not about the chimpanzees. No, 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 no. <laughs> I don't even know what that is. Well, I, I, years ago, I've colonoscoped chimpanzees. I just want to tell you. Yeah, I, that's. I was. He invited me, or I visited Stanford many years ago, really long time, and he was driving me. He picked me up, and we had breakfast. And there was a videotape on the seat. And I said, what's this? He says, well, I have to do a colonoscopy today. So I reviewed it last night how to do it. <laughs> and I'm thinking, this is a guy, um, he's got a review. He's, he's, so you don't do many, I guess, right? Um, or you just want to be sure you do it right. No, I, I, um, I did them. Um, I, one of the reasons I stopped practicing is it dawned on me, would I want to do my own colonoscopy? And the answer was <laughs> no. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> All right. Um, one more thing. Um, on your CV, you have this work for a textile museum. Uh, on your, for a museum. He knows this. W- w- what's that about? So I, when we really get good at genotype phenotyping for humans, I am positive that there are, are, is a genetic constel- constellation for the phenotype of being a collector. <laughs> 
and it's uh, and it segregates with maleness strongly, um, and um, so I've always been a collector and sort of interested in art. And we had no money when I first got married. I had a lot of hair. I looked kind of like a hippie, and. Um, when I would go into a fine art gallery, I, I really, I wanted a Paul Clay. That was my mm -hmm. desire. And it just became clear that I wasn't going to get there financially. Um, and I then got into Oriental Carpets, and it was, uh, it was something to collect. It was an art form. It was like the seediest um, part of art because... You, you know, uh, carpet dealers, they were either, um, they tried to trick you, um, it was your wits against them, um, and it was, um, you know, it's easy to buy a Picasso, you look for the name and then there's a value there. It's anonymous art, I sort of got into anonymous art where it's sort of, you know, it's, you, you, it's really your ability to dope it out. Um, so I now... I would say I know more about uh, tribal arts and, and textiles than I do about viruses, <laughs> if, to give you an idea of where. Harry told me once, don't collect carpets, you can't afford it. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't. All right, that's TWIV513. Thank you can find it at microbe.tv slash TWIV. Questions and comments go to TWIV at microbe.tv. If you want to help us financially, you can go over to microbe.tv slash contribute. We have a couple of ways you can do that, including Patreon, which could give us a buck a month. My guest today has been from Stanford University School of Medicine, Harry Greenberg. Thank you, Harry. Thank you, Vince. I hope you enjoyed it. I enjoyed it very much. I'm Vincent Racaniello. You can find me at virology.ws. I want to thank Yele Methensens. Is that good? Perfect. Thank you so much for having me. I know it's expensive to bring me here, but uh, I think it's worth it for your field to get some good publicity. And also for you in the audience to see that we do this to communicate science. I think it's really important to do, so I spend a good part of my time uh, doing it. And Yella asked me three years ago at ASV Madison if I would do this. That's how long you have to plan for these. I also want to thank ASM for their support of TWIV and Ronald Jenkins uh, for his music. You've been listening to This Week in Virology. Thanks for joining us. We'll be back next week. Another TWIV is viral. <laughs>